Today, an Advent message from Zechariah's Encounter with Gabriel. Welcome to Coffee with Creamer, where you get to sit down with our host, Dr. Barry Creamer, for a conversation about faith, life, and culture. We'll look at old ideas through a new lens, turn those culture wars on their head, and paint a picture of the way things could be. If you like your thinking deep and your coffee hot, pull up a chair. You're in the right place. It being the Christmas season seems appropriate to look at a Christmas passage today and understand why we celebrate Christmas the way we do, or at least one of the reasons we ought to celebrate Christmas the way we do, or a way we ought to celebrate Christmas if we don't. Uh, And I want to do this from Luke chapter 1. Luke 1 and 2 together comprise this profoundly important Christmas narrative where many of the things that we associate with the Christmas story itself are actually related to us. And so I just want to take one portion of it. But before I take that one portion, I want to remind you of one of the most important elements of the way those two chapters unfold for us, the birth and early childhood of Christ, and it's, it's in the way Luke always tells story and, and stories, and I've gone through Luke before in a different venue, not in these episodes, but not on this podcast, but, uh, and, and so we've covered these details before, but I just want to point out again how important it is that there are really three big narratives in Luke 1 and 2, one about John the Baptist, the announcement of his birth and his actual birth, and And then the same thing with Jesus, the announcement of his birth, and then his actual coming into the world, and then one about Jesus' early childhood. And the reason this is interesting, or the reason it's drawn together the way it is in Luke, is made evident by how Luke concludes each of those narratives. It's made obvious, I'll say, by how he concludes each of those narratives. In chapter 1, verse 80, he concludes the narrative about John the Baptist's birth by saying, So the child grew, this is John the Baptist, so the child grew and became strong in spirit and was in the deserts until the day of his manifestation to Israel. And then in chapter 2, in verse 40, after the story of Jesus' birth and his dedication in the temple and so on, it says, and the child Jesus grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. And again, if you don't remember John the Baptist's story concluded with the statement, so the child grew and became strong in spirit. And then about Jesus, the child grew and became strong in spirit. So, you you know, it's obvious that we're supposed to see those stories in parallel with each other. But then, only a dozen verses later, at the very end of chapter 2, in chapter 2, verse 52, John, uh, John, Luke concludes the story of Jesus' young childhood by saying this is, you know, when he goes back to the temple and he's teaching the people there and his parents finally find him, you know what I'm talking about, when he's lost in Jerusalem. It says, concluding that story, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. So obviously he's intending for us to see these narratives in parallel with each other in one way or another. And and what makes them important is, I mean, there's so many different elements where we could talk about the entirety of these two chapters together. Just the one thing that obviously uh, draws the attention of any reader to it who's paying attention is the importance of the temple. I mean, uh, Zechariah receives the announcement of Jesus' birth in the temple. Jesus is dedicated in the temple. Jesus returns to the temple to teach people, and his parents find him there and question what he's doing and so on. And so, you know, the centrality of the temple is unavoidable uh, if you're reading those two chapters. But What's most interesting about that fact, which is not what we'll focus on today, but what's most interesting about that fact 
is that the temple's underlying significance, and this is what we'll be looking at today, the temple's underlying significance for the people of God is just as relevant to us now. Yeah, I'm aware there's not a temple, but it's just as significant, the, the underlying significance of it is just as important to us, just as relevant to us now as it was to them then. And it is strongly recapitulated. The meaning of the temple experiences that the people of God had is strongly recapitulated in our annual observance of the Advent, of the Christmas season, the coming of Christ into the world. And I'm not saying by that that I want to focus on elements of the temple and how they show up in Christmas today. That would be a discussion for another day as well. And we did that actually last year on an episode uh, from this podcast talking about the Torn Veil. We actually called it Torn Veil Day, I think, uh, in that episode. Encourage you to go back and listen to that, Different, a different focus. But the focus today is on this one narrative, this one story about Zechariah, Zacharias and Gabriel revealing to him that John the Baptist is going to be born and then the declaration that he's going to be mute because of his lack of faith and so on and where that leads for us to understand uh, what this season has in importance for us. So really, it's uh, just Luke chapter 1, verses 5 through 25. So we're going to take it in three pieces. First, uh, just understanding what's going on when Zacharias finally goes into the temple to offer this sacrifice before God, to offer this incense before God in the temple, and what begins to happen with him there, and what that reveals to us about the meaning of the Christmas season, and also the meaning uh, that was going on in the lives of the people of Israel, the people of God, uh, at that time. So starting in verse 5, it says, There was, in the days of Herod, who was the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zecharias of the division of Abijah. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and the ordinances of the Lord, blameless. So these are faithful, not just Israelites, not just faithful Israelites, but faithful descendants of Levi, this priestly tribe, and descendants even within the priestly class in there. Okay, so, and yet, uh, you know, obviously Israel is filled with descendants in the Levitical tribe. And so it could be a, a, any number of people who are in here. That becomes important in just a moment. He's just one. So it's not like he's the high priest. It's not like he has great authority in Israel. But he's being faithful to his calling, both as an Israelite and as a Levite, a person in that tribe, this priestly tribe. He's even married to a descendant of Aaron, the priest, the one who is uh, uh, the origin of the priestly class, right? So under Levi's, uh, within Levi's tribe. So anyway, they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and they were both well advanced in years. So it was that while he was serving as priest before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people was praying outside at the hour of incense. Now, there are a lot of elements going on here to contribute to this reality that's going on in Israel at at, at the time, which is that they are longing for what God has not yet brought to pass. This is what's happening in Israel at the time. And it's and it happens throughout Israel's history. It's apparent through the Psalms and the prophets and all of the Old Testament that they desire this manifestation of God's righteousness, his holiness in the world, which hasn't yet appeared. And that gives them a reason to, to wail out to God. How long, Lord? When will this finally happen? And so all of this is being brought to our minds in this little uh, episode about Zacharias and just our introduction to him uh, in several different ways. One, the barrenness, the fact that Zacharias and Elizabeth are an old couple and they don't have any children yet. And it's not the case that you have to have children in order to be blessed. It's not the case that if you don't have children, you must be cursed and you're, you must be longing for the children that you don't have right now. That's not the case. But in their culture, it was the expectation. 
And so within their culture and within their expectation, they are a couple who had longed for children for ages in the same way that Israel had longed for the promises to be fulfilled for them. And so as an older couple, they model for us perfectly the reality that the people of God are longing for what God has not yet brought to pass, which is not new in Israel. Abraham and Sarah are an old couple who are waiting for a child to be born. God has promised he's going to bless the nations through this promised child, and yet they don't have any children, and they're an old couple. You know how it comes out. In, and Abraham even goes to God in Genesis 15 when God says, I'm going to bless you, and you're going to be... And Abraham says, well, I don't see how this is going to happen. I mean, a servant in my house is the person who's going to inherit all my goods when I die because I don't have a child. And God says to him, oh, you'll have one. It'll be, it'll be good. The point is that in their barrenness, they're modeling for us this truth about the people of God that's been present from the beginning, that we long for what God has not yet brought to pass. It's the same thing that's happening with Manoah and his wife in Judges 13. We'll talk more about why I'm choosing these particular examples, because there are plenty more examples than these. Uh, Even Jacob with Rachel, particularly with her, having to wait so long before they have a child, uh, is part of this story, that we're always longing for what God has not yet brought to pass. But with Manoah in Judges 13, you'll remember that when Uh, Manoah's wife meets the angel, and the angel starts talking to her, we are reminded that they are barren, that they have not been able to have a child, that they're longing for what God has not yet brought to pass. More about that one in a minute. The same thing with Hannah. I mean, Elkanah is able to have children with his other wife, but with Hannah, no children yet. He loves her, and he takes care of her and encourages her, but they long for a child, and Hannah longs for it so greatly, of course, that she goes up to the tabernacle to pray, and Eli sees her, and you'll remember the story that happens with Hannah, who desires so greatly to have what God has not yet brought to pass. So there's one, just one of the examples, the barrenness of Zechariah and Elizabeth, is this example of the fact that people of God are waiting for what the, what God hasn't brought to pass yet. But also, the incense is that. This is what the incense represents. Zacharias has the opportunity now, the lot has fallen on him, to go and offer incense in the temple this one time. This is the only time in his life he'll do it. And as he offers the incense, just like every priest who's ever offered the incense, he's offering up this symbolic manifestation, this representation of the prayers of the people of God that constantly rise before him saying, how long, O Lord, until you fulfill your promise to your people? And that's the case in the Old Testament, and it's the case all the way through the Revelation. When the when the, when the servants of God, the saints of God under the altar are, are, are raising their voices to God and saying, how long until you avenge our blood on our adversaries? Those prayers are the declaration of God's long, of the, of God's people's longing for the things that God has not yet brought to pass in the world. And that's what, and not only is the incense happening with him inside the temple, but the people who are praying outside the temple are praying specifically for that, the redemption of the people of Israel from the condition that they're in currently. That's what's going on, by the way, when you get to chapter 2, And Jesus has been born, and the parents take him back to the temple to be dedicated, and lo and behold, Anna is there. Remember, after the prayer of Simeon, Anna is there, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel. I'm reading from uh, chapter 2 in Luke, uh, verse 36. The daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher, she's of a great age. She represents the same thing, longing for it has not yet come to pass. And she had lived with a husband seven years for virginity. She was now 84 years old, or something like that, or 84 and 7, one or the other who did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers. Fastings and prayers are this representation, like through the ministry of John the Baptist and his disciples who fasted and prayed for what had not yet come to pass. It's their representation of wanting things to come to pass. So here she is fasting and praying, and coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to whom? To all the people who were at the temple, and what were they doing? To all those who looked for redemption in Israel 
That's what they desire to happen. This is the context that we're being brought to as we're introduced to Zechariah in this story. And by the way, it's not just their barrenness as a couple and the meaning of incense in prayer and the actual prayers of the people who are gathering at the temple and, and crying out to God to bring relief to them. It's not just those four different cases, but also the fact that Zacharias has waited his entire life for one opportunity to go into the temple, which might never come because there are so many people who can do this. It's just a, a really fortunate thing if you are chosen to be the one who's going to go in and offer the incense. And lo and behold, the lot finally falls on him. In that moment, Zechariah's entire life of waiting and longing for what God had not yet brought to pass is brought to the pinnacle so that we can see it. And then God says, now it's time. So the point here is that in the context of where we live in the world and how we live in the world, we have to be reminded that throughout all of history, not just in this episode, but throughout all of Israel's history, God's people are always longing for what God has not yet brought to pass. And if we're not, if we as people of God are not praying for and yearning for desiring what has not yet arrived in the world. I know you want to pause and say, but but Jesus did come to the world. But remember, in Jesus' ministry, he tells us to continue praying for what will come when he returns. So we find ourselves in exactly the same place, but with this one beautiful, powerful, final assurance that God is already at work bringing it to pass. More on that in a few minutes. The point is that if we are God's people, we are praying for and longing for and yearning for what has not yet arrived in the world. And if we're not doing that, then we're missing something. We're, we're taking advantage of opportunities that are, that are ours and not caring about the people who are around us, or we're just not aware of how much better things ought to be than they are. And I think all of that is a reminder of what it is to be the people of God. It is to desire not just something good enough, not just something better than what we've had so far. Well, I mean, this country is better than all the other countries. Yeah, but it's not heaven. It's not representing the holiness of God. We're not revealing the presence of God in the world the way we ought to. So we ought to desire that and long for it because the people of God are always doing that. Anyway, that's one idea in the background of what's going on with Zechariah's story. And by the way, I'm not, you can tell by the repetition, five different elements are pointing to that same thing within this narrative itself. But all of Israel's history testifies to that. So we don't, we don't have to read anything into it to say, if we're going to be the people of God, we need to be longing and desiring for things that have not yet happened, that God hasn't yet brought into the world. But starting in verse 11, there is something that we have in this world right now because we're the people of God and we live in that. It, it, you know, it's simple, obvious, right? Faith. We have faith. So right now, even though we're longing for what God hasn't brought into the world, we long for it with a faith that God has given us in this world. And the fact that God is the one who has given it to us is particularly important in the way the story is told to us. And it's funny because as we read this story, we're going to pick up in verse 11 now of chapter 1 in Luke. As we read the story, we usually read it incorrectly, as if uh, there's some kind of rebuke or correction going on here. But, it, but it's not a rebuke. It, it actually is an invitation for us to have faith. So starting in verse 11, then an angel of the Lord appeared to him. So here Zacharias waited his entire life for the opportunity to go into the temple and offer the incense, which is a symbol of the prayer of the people of God, waiting for God to do what he's never done. And lo and behold, God sends a messenger to Zechariah and says, I'm about to do in your life what you've been waiting your entire life for me to do. That, that's a beautiful narrative. Even if you don't care about the message itself, which is obviously much more powerful than the narrative by itself, even if you didn't care about the message, the narrative itself is told so beautifully, so powerfully. Uh, it's really worth saying all the time, certainly every Christmas. Anyway, then an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing on the right side of the altar of incense. You've been offering up these prayers. Your people have been altar offering up these prayers. I'm here. You're not going to have to wait much longer. Wait till you see what I'm about to do. And so Gabriel comes and stands beside him. And so when, when Zechariah saw him, the angel of the Lord, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. 
And you say, well, it just says angel. It doesn't say Gabriel. He'll say Gabriel in a minute. You'll see. So anyway, fear fell upon him. Well, of course fear falls upon him. It's the same as what happens to Manoah when he meets with the angel out in the field after his wife comes back and tells him, you got to come out and hear what this guy is saying to me. And they go out in the field together and the angel tells him what's going to happen and they offer a sacrifice and it's received and Manoah you know, falls down in fear. Oh, we're all, we're going to die because we've seen the face of God. And his wife is like, what's wrong with you? I mean, he told us we were going to have a child. How are we going to do that if we die? So you know, get over it, man. We're going to be okay. He, she can be rational about it. Manoah's terrified because these angels are powerful and intimidating. Be- Every time they show up, they have to tell people, stop shaking. It's okay. I'm not here to destroy you. Well, on occasion, they are there to destroy people. So on the other hand, maybe the intimidation is well-founded. So anyway, uh, Zachariah is reasonably afraid. Fear fell upon him. I bring that up, not just because it's in the story, but it's in the story to make the point that it's not going to be surprising that Zechariah's faith is weak. Faith and fear oppose each other. It doesn't mean that you can't have faith if you have fear, but I mean fear is the expression that we're not confident things are going to go right. Uh, we're, We're pretty worried about what's going to happen. And so obviously, when Jesus is in the boat with the disciples, that's why he says what he does. Oh, you of little faith, why are you so fearful? Uh, That's like a a reiteration of the statement. You're afraid, and therefore you don't have faith. So Zacharias is afraid, which tells us ahead of time. He's going to have trouble with this. He's going to have a hard time believing what Gabriel's about to say. So the angel says to him in verse 13 of Luke 1, Don't be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard. This is, and by the way, this is the same, remember, if we go back to 1 Samuel 1, this is what happens with Hannah in Hannah's prayer. She's murmuring her prayer, remember Eli, thinks she's drunk. She says, oh, I'm not drunk, please hear me. I just just long for a child. And, And Eli is able to say, you know, the Lord hears your petition. Your prayer is heard. And Gabriel is saying to Zechariah, you don't have to be afraid. Your prayer is heard. You're offering up this incense, and you've offered it for so long with the people of Israel, you think it's never going to be answered. Don't faint. It's going to be answered. In fact, I'm here to answer your prayer. Now, he's not saying to him yet, oh, and this is the Redeemer who's about to come, but he is saying to him, you yourself have had a personal prayer. Why can't me and my wife have a child? And your prayer is heard as well. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you'll call his name John. And now he goes on to say the things that bring this fulfillment, this response, this activity of God beyond just Zacharias to the people of God, to something he's doing within the covenant. And so he says, your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you'll call his name John, and you will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth. He's not just for you. I'm not just doing this for you as an individual so you and your wife can be satisfied. I'm doing it so many can rejoice at his birth. This is carrying forward the covenant that was given to Abraham in Genesis 12 when he says, you're going to have a child. I'm going to bless your child and I'm going to bless those who bless your child and in him all the families of the earth will be blessed. Here, many will rejoice at the birth of your son because he will be great in the sight of the Lord. And in the same way that Manoah and his wife were told by the angel, he's not going to eat or drink from the fruit of the vine. He's going to take this Nazarite vow, right? He says the same thing here about John the Baptist. He will be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He'll also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb, exactly like Samson was going to be in the birth that comes to Manoah and his wife in Judges 13. And in verse 16, he goes on in Luke 1, verse 16, to say he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. And now he quotes the very end of the book of Malachi and adds some more to it in Malachi 4, 5. He says, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children That's the quote from Malachi 4. And the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people 
who are prepared for the Lord. So here we've been waiting and waiting and, and desire, longing for what God has not done. And if, as God prepares to do it, he looks at his people and says, you, you're not ready. So I'm going to take the steps that are necessary for you to receive the blessing that comes with the fulfillment of this promise to have a Messiah for all these years. And Zacharias is in exactly that same position. He's been waiting his entire life for God to say, you can have a son, but he's been waiting for so long, he's become inured to the possibility that it would actually happen. And so his response is going to be to say, well, how would I know this is going to happen? And God is going to need to fill in the valleys for him. He's gonna need to smooth the mountains for him. You get the idea? Exactly as John the Baptist is going to do for the people of Israel to prepare them to receive the Messiah himself, Zacharias now needs the angel to do something to prepare him for the truth that he actually is going to have this child with his wife so that his faith can be established. That's the point, that he can establish the faith. He doesn't just show up and wave his hand and say, believe or don't believe, which, which, which is it? Ah, I'll cast you aside, you're not a believer. He doesn't do that. Instead, even when Zechariah doubts, which is expected, I mean, who wouldn't? Well, I'm an old man now. We've been waiting our whole lives. Are you, are you sure? And so, you know, Gabriel tells him, you're going to have a child. And Zacharias's response to the angel is, how, how can I know that this is true? In other words, I, I doubt what you're saying. I'm not unwilling to believe, but I'm having a hard time believing. So uh, can you give me some kind of assurance here that this is really true? You know, presumably, and, and this, is, this is adding in, but I, I do want to say, I mean, it, it's a natural thing. Presumably, he wants to know whether to tell his wife or not. Uh, if I'm going to walk out of here and tell people, hey, we're going to have a baby, I'm going to need more than just, you know, the words that you're giving me right now because nobody's going to believe me. He's Moses, right, on Mount Sinai. They're not going to believe me when I go. Who, who shall I say sent me? They're not, they're not going to believe me. What am I going to do for them? Oh, well, I'll give you a sign. Take your rod and cast it on the ground. Take off your, take your hand out of your coat and look at the leprosy on it. You see, you see what I'm saying? God does this for Moses on the mountain. Now Gabriel's going to do the same thing for Zacharias, for John the Baptist's father. So Zacharias says to the angel, well, how can I be sure that this is true? Because I'm an old man and my wife is... I'm not going to say she's an old woman, but she's well advanced in years, you know, so I don't know. Anyway, verse 19, the angel answered and said to him, and we read this as if it's a pure rebuke, as if Gabriel's pride is wounded. Oh, you, you don't know who I am? How can you question me? It's not that. I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. If you read it arrogantly like that, it, it leads in entirely the wrong direction. Well, Zacharias, you weakling, I, why on earth won't you just believe what we tell you, even though it's miraculous in nature and never happens in the world? It's not that. It's him saying, oh, you want to know how you can be assured of it? I, I'm not just some guy who showed up in the temple to give you a promise about something I can't do anything about. I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And you know what God told me to do? He told me to come to you and to bring you this good news. You've been waiting your entire life for this. And God told me to leave his presence to come to you so that I could give you this good news. This is not me handing you the Dallas Morning News and saying, <laughs> looks like this is what's going to happen. This is me coming from God to you to tell you it's going to happen. And I know you're going to need something now that will assure you that I actually came from God. So I'll give you a sign. You don't want, I know, you don't know what it's going to be. I'll tell you what it's going to be. I'll give you a sign. I'm going to make it so that you can't speak. You will be mute. You have the best news of your life to tell, and I'm going to make you mute. So you're going to walk outside, and you're going to want to tell everybody about it, and you're going to know the moment you open your mouth and nothing will come out that what I told you actually is true. And this becomes, well, I'll tell you in just a minute. We'll come to that. 
You'll be mute and not able to speak until the day these things take place, which means the day John the Baptist is born. John the Baptist, the one who is the messenger of God, the one who is the prophet of God, the one who is going to speak on God's behalf in preparation of the Messiah, finally coming in fulfillment of all of these promises until my messenger who will speak my words to my people to prepare them for my son who is going to come to them. Until he can speak, you won't speak. The parallels are, and the identification is profound here. And so he says, so you won't be able to speak until the, uh, until the day these things take place because, why? Now, this sounds like punishment. Well, you didn't believe. No, it's because you don't believe. So I've given you a sign so that you can believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. I'm giving you a sign. What he's saying is, I'm giving you a sign so that your unbelief can turn to belief. This is how patient and gracious God is in dealing with us. We've been waiting for so long. It's not a surprise we would have doubt, but it it is an insult to God. We believe you, God. We believe you, God. Please bring it. You're bringing it? I don't believe you. (laughs) That's what we do all the time. And his response is not to say, oh, you don't believe. Well, forget you. I'll go do it with somebody else. His response is to say, let me help you believe. Let me give you a reason to believe. And so outside, the people are waiting for Zacharias, and they are marveling that he's lingering so long in the temple, which is, by the way, its own little nod back to the first point, which was how the people of God are always longing for what God hasn't delivered yet. The length of the time they have to wait just for Zechariah to come out of the temple is another nod at the 400 years of silence between the Testaments, a 400 years of silence that's now being replicated in Zechariah's silence. They wait 400 years for Elijah in John the Baptist, the actual person, John the Baptist, to show up and begin speaking again as the final prophet who would lead to the Son of God. They wait 400 years for that in the years we call the silent time, the silence between the Testaments. And in that silence, we're seeing replicated in Zechariah's the silence, which is his, until John the Baptist finally emerges and is able to speak. So the, the point here is that, oh, so they're waiting. They're, they're marveling that he lingers so long in the temple. But when he finally came out, lo and behold, he can't speak, which is, you know, this, again, not just, it's not just a replication of the narrative. It's now a sign from God. I'm at work. I am bringing the answer. So he could not speak to them, and they perceived, they know, ooh, something's happened here, because he could speak going in, and he can't now. They can see the sign. He can't speak the words, but they can see that God is active. And so they begin to speak to him. They perceive that he, that he, he must, when they see that he can't speak to them, they perceive that he must have seen a vision in the temple because he beckoned to them but remained speechless. So here the point is that The issue of faith and faithfulness and us believing is not an issue about God. He's not the question. God is faithful. We are the question. Do we have faith? And the great thing about this is that even when we don't, God works to give us faith, to give us a reason to have faith. Muteness isn't Zechariah's punishment here. It's a sign so that Zechariah, with his legitimate doubts, will have faith that Gabriel's words are going to come to pass, that God really is faithful. The sign is the evidence of God's faithfulness and our need for faith. And in in, in the fact that God is responding to Zechariah's prayer here, and this will come up uh, in the third point as well, but in this point that right now the people of God have faith, the fact that God is responding to our prayers is, has been apparent in the Old Testament. When we, when we begin to pray, we desire this thing to happen. God says, remember to Daniel in Daniel 9, you know, at the beginning of your supplications, the command went out. I have come to tell you now. You're seeing now what God was already doing because you're greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision in that appearance that Daniel has with an angel who tells him God is at work. Believe us trust us. The question is simply whether we are willing to have faith in his faithfulness. Are we willing to believe? Are we willing to be established 
in our faith. And, and interestingly enough, that's the point back in Isaiah 7 when Isaiah is giving Ahaz a promise that his enemies are going to be defeated. Ahaz doesn't believe it. Ahaz doubts it because there's not enough evidence that it would happen. And Isaiah knows that Ahaz has doubts. And so he says, look, uh, God wants to prove this to you. He wants to show you that it's true. Ask him for a sign. Ahaz is like, no, 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 I'm not, I don't want to tempt God. Well, what he means by that statement, I don't want to tempt God. What that means is, and, and there's a reason not to want to tempt God. He tells us not to tempt him, like the people of Israel do in the wilderness, right? We're not supposed to do that. But that's a statement that we're supposed to believe God. Don't doubt God. Ahaz already doubts God. So him saying, oh, no, no, I don't, I don't want to tempt God, is him saying, I don't want God to know that I'm doubting him. I, I don't want him to be aware of that. God already knows. If our faith is weak, it's not like God is going to be surprised by it. He is fully aware. And so when he says to Ahaz, hey, ask for a sign, and Ahaz says, I, I don't want to ask him for a sign. I, I don't want to make him aware of how doubting I am. Isaiah says, oh, for crying out loud. God will give you his own sign. He will prepare a sign for you, and, and it will be that a virgin will conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. It's Isaiah 7, 14, the thing that actually leads to, to us understanding what Jesus' birth is about when he's born to Mary, the virgin, right? Isaiah 7 is a statement about this. Even when our faith is weak, even when we have doubts, God is willing to work to bring our faith to bear to have confidence that he is going to do what he said he's going to do, that he is going to bring it to pass. Okay, so you've got the idea all the way down through verse 22 now. Just three more verses, verses 23 through 25. So it was, as soon as the days of his service were completed, that he departed to his own house. Now, after those days, lo and behold, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and she hid herself five months, saying, Thus has the Lord dealt with me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. Now, let's be clear here about this reproach. There's nothing wrong with a woman not having a child, nothing wrong with a woman never getting married, nothing wrong at all with any of those things, but in their culture, they shamed women who did not have a child. And that's what she's dealing with. It's just like bullies at the elementary school. You can tell your kid, it doesn't matter what those people think, but it still hurts. And so in the same way, Elizabeth has been dealing with her people shaming her her entire life. And now she says, can you believe God is going to take away that pain of shame that I've had with all of our friends who treated me like a pariah because I couldn't have a child. Un, 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 for, you know, it's sad that they did that, but that was the reality of their culture. But glorious that she's able to rejoice in it. It's not new. That's what's going on in the Old Testament with Naomi, who returns, remember, to, to Bethlehem after having left because Bethlehem was in drought, so she leaves to go to Moab, where everything is taken from her. Her sons die. Her daughters-in-law then can't have her children because, you know, her sons died and they didn't have any children. And so she's going to come back to Bethlehem because now Bethlehem has bread. And so she wants to return to it, tells her daughters-in-law to stay, and Ruth comes with her. Remember? Ruth comes back with her. And when they come into the town, she tells the people of the town, don't call me Naomi anymore. I'm not pleasant. I'm not blessed. Call me Mara. Call me bitterness, Mary's name you know, call me Mara because I've been cursed. We are longing for what God has not yet brought. And so the rest of the story, all of it about Ruth and her having the child and so on, is really about Naomi because at the end of the, at the, end of the book, in chapter 4, verse 14, the women respond to Naomi after Ruth has the child, and they say, blessed is the Lord who has not left you this day without a close relative and may his name be famous in Israel. May he be to you the restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age because your daughter-in-law, Ruth, who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons, has borne him. Then Naomi took the child, laid him on her bosom, became a nurse to him, and also the neighbor women gave him a name saying, there's born to Naomi, uh, there is a son born to Naomi, and they called his name servant Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. There is, there is a son born to Naomi. 
That's what they said. And that's what, that's what Elizabeth is experiencing here. The, the whole recovery of her future and her hope based on their community's expectations of where that would come from, they really do come to her through this promise that God has given. You know, the amazing thing about this is that as we're being told this story, we're first being told that everybody, including Zechariah, are longing for what God's not done to this point, but that in the meantime, they have faith. And so our faith may be weak, but God's working to build that faith. So we have confidence, what? That God will do something? But that's a misplaced confidence. Our confidence isn't that God will do something. Our faith is in a God who's already at work. Gabriel doesn't show up to say to Zechariah, you know, in nine months, God's going to be active in your life and you're finally going to have a son. No, he's there to declare to him, your wife is, uh, you know, going to conceive a son here. And uh, for five months, Elizabeth already knows that God is at work bringing all of this to pass while she's in hiding, while there's silence about it. This is the point that God doesn't begin to work when John the Baptist is born. They just need faith that God is already at work as John the Baptist is being conceived and as they're going for, and even in John the Baptist's life. It's not about John the Baptist. It's about Jesus coming. But our faith is not in what God will do. Our faith is in a God whose faithfulness is already at work. He's already faithful. This is is why I said we should learn something about the way we observe Christmas every year, the Advent season, Every year, a lot of churches, a lot of families will have Advent candles. You know, they'll have four candles, and uh, different families do it different ways. Different churches do it different ways. But you'll have often four candles, and then this one, it's almost like a unity candle for a wedding, right? So this one candle that is the candle for Advent, the one that represents Christmas Day itself. And once a week, you will light another candle leading up to Christmas during the Advent season. So you light each candle, and then finally, the last candle is lit, right? So on those Advent candles, the whole, the whole point of it is anticipation for when that big candle, the one central candle, is going to be lit. But it doesn't begin when the big candle is lit. You know, oh, well, here, we've lit the first candle. Well, that's nothing. Nothing's going on now. It is the Advent season. That's what that candle being lit means. And it's the anticipation now that we know that flame is finally going to move to the central candle. It's, it's only on the outside candles right now, but it's going to move to the central candle. This is what those candles represent. And, and by the way, it's not distinct from what children are encountering every year when they're waiting for the gifts to be opened. I mean, they want Christmas Day or Christmas Eve whenever you open the gifts in your house. That's what the kids are dying to happen. But when the gifts show up, when mom comes back from the mall, you already know it's happening. You know, it's, it's happening now. The things that make it happen are already transpiring. We're just waiting for the event itself to reveal the absolute truth of it. Same thing with these Advent candles I'm talking about. And so my point is, you know, the fact, and to put this in Zechariah's day, that the incense is wafting up before God during every worship time is already evidence that God is listening to our prayers, receiving our cries, and bringing about their resolution. The fact that the lot finally fell on Zechariah to go into the temple itself and offer the sacrifice is the anticipation, yeah, that he's going to hear from Gabriel, but already evidence that God is working. He's already bringing Zacharias into the temple so that he can hear Gabriel's pronouncement. Gabriel appearing to Zechariah is not just testimony that Gabriel has showed up and decided something now. God sent Gabriel. God is already at work bringing about not just John the Baptist's birth, but John the Baptist's birth and what that will mean for Jesus, his son, and his ministry in this world. The fact that his formerly barren wife is expecting for five months in secret anticipating that John the Baptist is going to be born and that he's going to prophesy. God's already at work while she's pregnant for those five months. They're all evidences that God is already at work to give his son in redemption 
for mankind. The fact, here's Christmas, that Christ has already come is our greatest testimony that God is already at work making all things right in this world. This Christmas, may we remember that the candles which light our peace, the resolution to our fears, the reconciliation with our enemies, with our friends, with our families, that the candles which will end the darkness of all of our struggles, that those candles are already lit. Merry Christmas Eve. Thanks for joining us for Coffee with Cream. Your cup of coffee may be finished, but we are not. <laughs> Come back next week for a refill as we sit down to examine a new set of ideas and cultural issues. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts or visit our website at barrycreamer.com. Until next time, keep your mug hot and your mind sharp.